one dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. Della counted it three times. She was very careful with money and bought only the cheapest food, but she only had one dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day was Christmas. There was nothing to do, so she sat down and cried. <laughs> Della lived in New York City in a poor little apartment. The rent was eight dollars a week. The name on the front door of their flat was Mr. James Dillingham Young. In the past, he earned thirty dollars a week, but now he earned only twenty dollars a week. When he came home after work, Della always hugged him, and this was very good. Della stopped crying and dried her face. She stood by the window and looked at a gray cat on the gray street. Tomorrow will be Christmas Day, and I have only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy Jim a Christmas present. She thought. She wanted to buy him something fine and beautiful. She wanted to show him that she loved him a lot. There was a small mirror on the wall, and Della stood in front of it. Her eyes were bright. She pulled down her beautiful long hair. It went below her knees. Now the James Dillingham Youngs had two very special things. One was Jim's gold pocket watch. It belonged to his father, and before that, to his grandfather. The other special thing was Della's hair. She put up her hair again. A tear or two fell on the old red carpet. Then she put on her old brown coat and her old brown hat, and quickly went out with her eyes still shining. She stopped in front of a door with a sign, "Madame Sofroni, Hair Goods." Della opened the door and saw a big woman. "Will you buy my hair?" asked Della. "I buy hair," said Madame Sofroni. "Take your hat off and show me your hair." Della's beautiful brown hair fell down. Twenty dollars," said Madame Sofroni, and she touched the long hair with her expert hand. "Cut it off quickly, and give me the money," said Della. During the next two hours, Della went to many stores, and looked for Jim's present. She found it at last. It was perfect for Jim—a simple gold chain for his pocket watch. He was proud of his pocket watch, but it had no chain. The gold chain cost twenty-one dollars, and Della hurried home happily with it and the eighty-seven cents. When she got home, she looked at her very short hair in the mirror. Oh dear, what can I do with my hair? She thought. She was very busy with her hair for the next forty minutes. Then she looked in the mirror again. She looked like a schoolboy with tiny curls all over her head. What's Jim going to say when he sees me? She thought. But what could I do with one dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was ready and the frying pan was on the stove. Jim was never late. Della had the gold chain in her hand, and she waited for him near the door. Then she heard his footsteps on the stairs, and she was afraid for a moment. I hope Jim still thinks I'm pretty. She thought. The door opened and Jim came in. He was thin and serious. He needed a new overcoat, and he had no gloves. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two years old, and he already had a family. His eyes were fixed on Della. She could not understand the look on his face. He was not angry or surprised. He simply looked at her with a strange expression on his face. Della ran to him. Jim, darling," she cried. "Don't look at me that way. I sold my hair because I wanted to give you a present. My hair will be long again; it grows quickly. Oh, Jim, say Merry Christmas and let's be happy. I have a beautiful gift for you. Did you cut off your hair?" asked Jim slowly. "Yes, I cut it off and sold it," said Della. Don't you like me any more? I'm still Della. Jim looked around the room. You cut your hair? Jim said again, almost stupidly. Yes, I sold it because I love you so much, Jim. Shall I get dinner ready now? Jim put his arms around Della. Then he took a package from his overcoat pocket 
and threw it on the table. Don't worry about me, Della, he said. I will always love you. It doesn't matter if your hair is short or long. But if you open the package, you'll see why I was strange before. Della was excited, and she quickly opened the package. She gave a little scream of happiness, oh. but then she started crying. <laughs> There were the combs, two beautiful tortoiseshell combs with little jewels. They were the perfect color for her hair. When Della saw them the first time in a store window on Broadway, she wanted them. She knew they were expensive combs, and now they were hers. But she did not have long hair any more. Della held the combs in her hand. And looked at them. She smiled lovingly at Jim and said, "My hair grows very fast, Jim." Then Della jumped up like a cat and cried, "Oh, oh!" She showed Jim his beautiful gift. "Isn't it splendid, Jim? I looked everywhere to find it. Now you'll look at your watch a hundred times a day. Give me your watch. Let's see how it looks on the new chain." Jim sat down, put his hands behind his head, and smiled. Della, he said, "Let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use now. I sold my watch to get the money to buy you the combs. And now, let's have dinner." The last leaf. In a little area. West of Washington Square in New York City, there are many streets called places. Artists soon discovered these places and began living there. They liked the cheap rents and the old attics. This area became a colony of artists, and it was called Greenwich Village. Sue and Johnsy had their studio at the top of a brick building. Johnsy was Joanna's nickname, and she was from California. Sue was from Maine. They met at an eating place and became best friends. In May, they opened an artist's studio together. In November, a cold, invisible stranger came to the colony. Doctors called him pneumonia. He touched a good number of artists with his cold finger, including Johnsy. Poor Johnsy, she was a thin little woman. And she lay quietly in her bed. She looked outside the window at the brick wall of the house in front of her. One morning, a busy doctor examined Johnsy, and measured her temperature. Then, he went into the hall and talked to Sue. She has about one chance in ten, he said, as he looked at the thermometer. She must want to live. Your friend doesn't want to get well. Does she think about anything special? Does she have a sweetheart? No, she doesn't have a sweetheart, but she wants to paint the Bay of Naples one day. Well, I will do everything I can to help her, but when a patient begins to count the carriages in her funeral procession, then science and medicine can do very little. The doctor left, and Sue went to her room and cried a lot. After a while. She walked cheerfully into Johnsy's bedroom. She had her drawing paper and pencils in her hand. Johnsy lay in bed and did not move. She's probably sleeping, Sue thought, and she began to draw a picture. She drew an Idaho cowboy with elegant riding trousers. It was an illustration for a magazine story. Young artists often draw illustrations for magazine stories to make some money. Suddenly, she heard a strange sound, and went to Johnsy's bed. Her eyes were open now. She was looking out of the window and counting. Twelve, she said, and then eleven, ten, nine, and then eight, seven. Sue looked out of the window too. What was Johnsy counting? There was only the brick wall of a building with an old ivy vine on it. It was autumn, and only a few leaves remained on the ivy vine. What is it, dear? Asked Sue. Six, whispered Johnsy. They're falling faster now. Three days ago, 
There were almost a hundred. There goes another one. There are only five now. Five what, dear? Asked Sue. Leaves on the ivy vine. When the last leaf falls, I must go too. Didn't the doctor tell you? <laughs> what nonsense! Said Sue. Don't be silly. You'll get well soon. Drink some hot soup now. I must finish this drawing and sell it to the magazine. I need money to buy good food for us. No, I don't want any soup. Said Johnsy. She looked out of the window and said, "There goes another leaf. Now there are four. I want to see the last one fall. Then I'll go too." Johnsy, dear," said Sue. "Close your eyes and don't look out of the window, please." Tell me when you finish drawing, Sue. I want to see the last leaf fall. I'm tired of waiting. Sleep a little now," said Sue. "I must go and call Berman. I need a model for my drawing. I'll be back in a minute." Old Berman was a painter. He lived downstairs in the same building, and he liked Sue and Joanna. He was about sixty years old, had a long white beard, and drank too much. Old Berman was not a good or successful artist. Sue found him in his dark little room. In one corner of the room, there was an old white canvas with nothing on it. Johnsy is very ill with pneumonia. She doesn't want to get better. She has some strange ideas and wants to die when the last leaf on the ivy vine falls. I'm scared and I don't know what to do. Old Berman started crying. And then said with his German accent, "What nonsense! She wants to die because leaves fall off an ivy vine. What foolishness! Poor little Miss Chauncey." Sue was sad and silent. Then she looked at Berman and said, "I need a model for one of my drawings. Can you come upstairs?" Well, all right. <laughs> I'll be your model this time, but. But one day I'll paint my masterpiece. They went upstairs, and Johnsy was sleeping. Sue and Berman went into the other room. They looked at the ivy vine fearfully. Then they looked at each other silently. Outside, it was raining, and it was very cold. Berman sat down, and Sue began drawing. When Johnsy woke up the next morning, she said. Please pull the curtain, Sue. Sue pulled the curtain, and they both looked out of the window. After the wind and rain of the night, there was still one ivy leaf on the brick wall. It was the last one on the vine. The leaf was green and yellow. It is the last one," said Johnsy. "It did not fall during the night. It will fall today, and I will die at the same time." Oh dear, dear," said Sue. "Think of me. What will I do?" But Johnsy did not answer. Her thoughts were far away. The day passed, and the last ivy leaf was still on the ivy vine. Then it started raining again, and it was very windy. The next morning, Johnsy looked for the last ivy leaf. It was still on the vine. She looked at it for a long time. Then she called Sue. "I was a bad girl, Sue," said Johnsy. "That last leaf showed me that I was bad. I wanted to die, and that was very wrong. Please bring me some soup now and some milk too. No, first bring me a small mirror." An hour later, she said, "Sue, one day I will paint the Bay of Naples." The doctor came in the afternoon, and Sue spoke to him in the hall. Now she has five chances in ten. She must eat well and rest, and she'll get better. And now I must see another patient downstairs. I think his name is Berman, and he's an artist. He has pneumonia too. He is an old, weak man, and there is no hope for him. He must go to the hospital today. He will be more comfortable there. The next day, the doctor came again. Johnsy is out of danger. Good food and good care. That's all, he said to Sue. And that afternoon, Sue sat on Johnsy's bed and said, "I must tell you something, Johnsy. Mister Berman died of pneumonia today in the hospital. 
The janitor found him a few days ago in his room. He was very ill. His shoes and clothes were wet and very cold. The janitor found a lantern, a ladder, some paintbrushes, and some green and yellow paints. Look out of the window, dear, at the last ivy leaf on the vine. It never moved when it was windy. Ah,、oh, Johnsy, it's Berman's masterpiece. He painted it on the wall the night the last leaf fell. The Clarion Call. You can find half of this story in the records of the New York City Police Department, and the other half in the records of a newspaper office. Mr. Norcross, the New York millionaire, was murdered by a burglar in his apartment. Two weeks later, the murderer met Detective Barney Woods on Broadway. Is that you, Johnny Kernan? Asked Woods. Yes, it is, said Kernan happily. And you're Barney Woods of St. Joe. What are you doing in the East? I now live in New York City. I'm a detective for the New York Police Department. Well, well, well," said Kernan, smiling happily. "Come into Muller's Cafe," said Woods, "and let's find a quiet table. I want to talk to you, Kernan." It was almost four o'clock in the afternoon, and there weren't many people in the cafe. They found a quiet table, and Kernan sat down in front of the detective. Kernan was well dressed and self-confident. Woods was short, pale, and wore a cheap suit. "What are you doing now?" asked Woods. "You left St. Joe a year before me." "I'm in the gold mining business," said Kernan. "Perhaps I'll open an office here." "Well, well. So old Barney is a New York detective. You were in the police in St. Joe after I left, weren't you?" "Yes, I was there for six months," said Woods. Now there's one more question, Johnny. In your other burglaries, you never used a gun. Why did you kill Norcross? Kernan looked at his drink for a few moments. Then he looked at the detective with a big smile. How did you discover this, Barney? He asked with admiration. I thought I did a perfect job, didn't I? Woods put a very small gold pencil on the table. It was a little watch charm. This is the little charm I gave you when we were in St. Joe. I found it under the table in Norcross's room. Be careful of what you say, Johnny. We were friends once, but now I'm a detective, and I must do my duty. In the state of New York, murderers get the electric chair. Kernan laughed. <laughs> I'm lucky, Woods. Kernan said. He put one hand inside his coat. Woods immediately put his hand on his gun. "Put it away," said Kernan. "And I'll tell you why I shot Norcross. The foolish old man came towards me with a gun and started shooting. The old lady was very nice. She just stayed in bed and watched everything. I took her twelve thousand dollar diamond necklace, and she said nothing. I think she married old Norcross for his money. There were six rings, two pendants, and an expensive watch." Everything was worth about fifteen thousand dollars. Don't tell me all this," said Woods. "Oh, it's all right," said Kernan. "Everything is in my suitcase at the hotel, and now I'll tell you why I'm talking. Because it's safe. I'm talking to a man I know. You owe me a thousand dollars, Barney Woods. You won't arrest me. I remember," said Woods. "You gave me one thousand dollars." One day I'll pay back the money. The thousand dollars saved me. They were putting my furniture out on the street when I got home that night. You're a good, honest man," continued Kernan. "And you can't arrest me because you owe me money." The waiter came and brought them some drinks. Woods looked at the little gold pencil and said, "I can't arrest you. I didn't pay back the thousand dollars. It's a bad situation for me." But you helped me once, Johnny, and now I must do the same. I knew it," said Kernan, smiling. "I can judge men, Woods. I'm silent only because I owe you money. Otherwise, you couldn't escape," said Woods. "I know I couldn't," said Kernan. "That's why I knew I was safe with you. You see, Kernan, I'm a man first, and then a detective. And now I'll let you go, and I'll leave the New York City police." 
I'll probably go and drive a truck. I'll never be able to pay back the thousand dollars. Oh, you can keep it, said Kernan. But I know you want to pay it back one day. I was lucky that you borrowed it. But let's change the subject. Tomorrow, I'm going to the west on the train. I know a place where I can sell the jewels. Have another drink, Barney, and forget your problems. Let's have fun tonight. I'm in the hands of my old friend, Barney Woods. All evening, Kernan told Woods many stories about his successful wrongdoings and clever criminal plans. Woods became very irritated by this vicious man. Be very careful, Kernan. The newspapers could write about the Norcross case again, because there were a lot of burglaries and murders in New York this summer. Kernan suddenly became angry. I don't care about the newspapers. What can the newspapers do? They can send reporters and photographers to the scene of the crime. They can write about it, but they can't catch the burglar. Well, I don't know, said Woods slowly. Some newspapers do very good work. There's the Morning Mars, for example. They help to catch a criminal when the police forgot about him. I'll show you, said Kernan. Getting up confidently, I'll show you what I think of newspapers in general and the Morning Mars in particular. There was a telephone booth near their table. Kernan went inside the booth and left the door open. He found a number in the telephone book and phoned. Woods sat quietly and looked at Kernan's cold and arrogant face. He listened carefully. Hello, the Morning Mars. I want to speak to the editor. He waited a few moments with his vicious little smile. Are you the editor? I'm the man who killed Old Norcross. Wait, this is not the usual crank call. I killed the old man at two thirty a.m. two weeks ago. What? You don't believe me? You don't understand. I'm giving you the biggest scoop in the history of your boring little newspaper. What? Really? Well, you can't expect me to give you my name and address, can you? No, this is not a rival newspaper. I killed Old Norcross, and I have the jewels in a suitcase. Well, I'm not going to tell you the name of the hotel. Now, listen. Half of the second button on Mrs. Norcross's nightgown is broken. I saw it when I took the ring off her finger. Kernan looked at Woods and said, "Ah, he believes me now." Then he started talking on the phone again. Hello. Yes, I'm here. What? You want to catch me in forty-eight hours? Stop being foolish. Just continue writing your stories about divorces, accidents, and the dirty scandals you write about. Kernan hung up the phone and said, "He's really furious now." Well, Barney, let's go and enjoy ourselves tonight. We can have dinner and see a musical comedy. I only need four hours sleep. And then I'm going west. Kernan and Woods had dinner in a Broadway restaurant and went to see a musical comedy. Kernan spent a lot of money. At half past three in the morning, they went to an all-night cafe. Kernan continued talking in his fast, arrogant manner. Woods listened and thought sadly about the end of his career as a detective. But suddenly, his eyes became bright. I wonder if it's possible, he thought. I wonder if it's possible. Outside, it was early morning. The big city was waking up. Woods could hear the first noises of the day. One of the noises was the cries of the newspaper boys with the latest news, the Clarion Call. Woods gave ten cents to a waiter and said, "Buy me a morning Mars, please." When he got the paper, he looked at the first page. Then he took a page out of his notebook and began writing with a little gold pencil. What's the news? Asked Kernan. Woods showed him the piece of paper. Please pay to John Kernan the thousand-dollar reward that is mine for his arrest, Barnard Woods. You tease them so much on the phone, and they put you on the first page of the Morning Mars. Now, Johnny, you'll come to the police station with me. The origins of the American police. Listening activity. What's your name? My name's Bob. Bob Johnson. Where do you work as a policeman? I work in New York City. 
How long have you been a policeman? Let's see. I've been a policeman for about 14 years. Do you have a partner who you work with? Yes, I do. What's his or her name? James. Do you like your job? Yes, I love it. What do you like the most about it? The excitement. The job is completely different every day. What do you like the least about the job? The danger. It can be a very dangerous job. Thank you for your time, Bob. You're welcome. The thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. Repeated Lawyer Tolman. And here's the money. His voice was formal and distant. Young Gillian laughed as he touched the small package of money. It's such an awkward amount, he said to the lawyer. With ten thousand dollars, you can really have fun. Even fifty dollars are less of a problem. You heard your uncle's will, continued Lawyer Tolman. Did you listen carefully? Remember that you must tell us exactly how you spend the one thousand dollars as soon as you spend it. It's best that you write a list for us. These were Mr. Gillian's last wishes. Of course I will," said the young man politely. "Perhaps I'll need a secretary to help me write the list." Gillian put the small package of money into his coat pocket and went to his club. At his club, he looked for Old Bryson, who was forty years old and calm. He was reading a book and took off his glasses when he saw Gilliam. "Wake up, Old Bryson," said Gilliam. "I have a funny story to tell you." Why don't you tell it to someone else? Said Old Bryson. You know I hate your stories. This one is better than usual. Said Gillian. It's sad and funny. My uncle left me one thousand dollars in his will. Now what can a man do with a thousand dollars? I thought your uncle was a very rich man with about half a million dollars. Said Old Bryson, showing very little interest. He was. Said Gillian happily. That's why it's so funny. He left one part of his money to the scientist who will discover a new germ, and the other part to build a hospital that will destroy the germ. Then the butler and the housekeeper got a special ring and ten dollars each, and I got a thousand dollars. You have plenty of money to spend," said Old Bryson. "Oh yes, plenty," said Gillian. "My uncle was very generous with me." "Are there any other heirs?" asked Old Bryson. "None, except for Miss Hayden." A ward of my uncle who lived in his house. She's a quiet girl, the daughter of one of his friends. Now tell me, old Bryson, what can a man do with a thousand dollars? Old Bryson cleaned his glasses and smiled. Gillian knew that when old Bryson smiled, he was going to be very offensive. A thousand dollars can be a lot of money or very little money, he said. A man can buy a home with it and be very happy. You can buy milk for one hundred babies for three months and save their lives. It can give an ambitious boy an education. A man can buy a real Corot painting. You can also live well in a New Hampshire town for two years. But you, Bobby Gillian, can do only one thing. You can buy Miss Lotta Laurier a diamond pendant with a thousand dollars. Thanks," said Gillian. "I knew you could solve the problem." Gillian phoned for a taxi. He said to the driver, "Please take me to the Columbine Theater." Miss Lotta Laurier was getting ready for her performance. When she saw Gillian, she said, "What is it, Bobby? I have a performance in two minutes." This won't take two minutes. Would you like a little pendant? I can spend a thousand dollars on it. Oh, all right," said Miss Laurier. "Where is my hat, Bobby? Did you see the necklace Della Stacy was wearing the other night?" It cost two thousand two hundred dollars at Tiffany's, but all right. Miss Laurier, you're on stage in a minute," cried the manager of the theater. Gillian returned to his taxi. "What can a man do with one thousand dollars?" he asked the driver. "Open a saloon," said the driver immediately. "I know a perfect place for a saloon where I can make lots of money and." "Please drive until I tell you to stop," said Gillian. They drove down Broadway, and Gillian saw a blind man on the sidewalk. He was sitting on a chair and selling pencils. Gillian got out of the taxi and stood in front of him. "Excuse me," he said. "But what can you do with a thousand dollars?" 
You just got out of the taxi, didn't you? Asked the blind man. Yes, I did, said Gillian. I think you must be a gentleman if you ride a taxi during the day. Take a look at this, please. He took a small book from his coat pocket and gave it to Gillian. Gillian opened it and saw that it was a bank deposit book. It showed a sum of one thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars. Gillian returned the bank deposit book and got into the cab. I forgot something, he said. Drive to the law offices of Tolman and Sharp. Lawyer Tolman looked at him severely through his glasses. Excuse me," said Gillian cheerfully. "May I ask you a question? Did my uncle leave Miss Hayden anything besides the ring and the ten dollars?" "Nothing," said Mister Tolman. "Thank you very much, sir," said Gillian, and he returned to his taxi. He gave the driver the address of his late uncle's home. Miss Hayden was writing letters in the library. She was small and thin, and she wore black clothes, but she had lovely eyes. Gillian entered and said, "I was at the lawyer's office, and he found an additional clause to my uncle's will. It seems that he left you one thousand dollars. Mister Tolman asked me to bring you this money. Here it is. Please count it to see if it's right." Gillian put the money near her hand on the desk. Miss Hayden's face turned white. Oh, she said, and again, oh. Gillian turned and looked out of the window. I think you know that I love you, Gillian said. I am sorry, said Miss Hayden, taking her money. Then there is no hope, asked Gillian. I am sorry, she said again. May I write a note, asked Gillian with a smile. He sat down at the big library table. She gave him some paper and a pen. Gillian wrote, "Paid by Robert Gillian. One thousand dollars to the best and dearest woman in the world, for all the happiness she brings to people." Gillian put his note into an envelope and went away. His taxi stopped again at the law offices of Tolman and Sharp. "I spent the thousand dollars," he said happily. And I am here to tell you exactly how I spent them. He threw the white envelope on the lawyer's table. Mister Tolman did not touch the envelope and went to a door and called his partner, Mister Sharp. Together, they opened the big safe. They took out a large envelope and slowly opened it. Mister Gillian, Mister Tolman said formally, "There is a codicil to your uncle's will. He gave it to us privately." It can be opened only after you spend the thousand dollars. This is what it says: Dear Robert, spend the thousand dollars wisely and carefully, and you will receive fifty thousand dollars in bonds. Spend the money carelessly and foolishly, as you did in the past, and the fifty thousand dollars in bonds will go to Miriam Hayden, my ward, your uncle Septimus Gillian. Now, Mister Sharp and I will examine your note and then decide. Mister Tolman put out his hand to take the note, but Gillian was quicker. He took it and tore it into little pieces and put them in his pocket. Oh, it's all right," he said, smiling. "I don't want to disturb you with this. I lost the thousand dollars at the horse races.、Uh, good day to you, gentlemen." Tolman and Sharp looked at each other and shook their heads. Gillian left. And whistled happily as he waited for the elevator. The ransom of Red Chief. Part one. It looked like a good thing, but wait until I tell you. Bill Driscoll and I were in Alabama when he had the kidnapping idea. There is a town in Alabama called Summit. The inhabitants of the town were very normal people. Bill and I had about six hundred dollars. We needed two thousand dollars more for our scheme in Illinois. We discussed everything in front of our hotel. Summit is the best place for kidnapping, I said. Parents love their children in small towns, and Summit doesn't have an important newspaper with curious reporters, said Bill. You're right. 
Summit probably has only one lazy sheriff. It looks like the perfect place for kidnapping, I said. We chose our victim carefully. He was the only child of an important man named Ebenezer Dorset. Mr. Dorset was respectable and stingy. The kid was a boy of ten with red hair. I'm sure Ebenezer Dorset will pay the ransom of two thousand dollars for his little boy, I said to Bill, but wait until I tell you. About two miles from Summit, there was a little mountain and a forest. We found a cave here. It was the perfect hiding place for us. We bought food and drink and put it in the cave. One evening, we passed by the Dorset's house with a horse and buggy. The kid was in the street. He was throwing stones at a little cat. Hey, little boy! cried Bill. The boy threw a stone at Bill's eye. This will cost Mr. Dorset five hundred dollars more, said Bill angrily. The boy fought like a bear, but at last we put him in the buggy. We drove away quickly and took him to the cave. That evening, I took the horse and buggy back to the village, and then I returned to the cave. When I arrived, there was a campfire at the entrance of the cave. Bill had some scratches on his face. The boy had two big feathers in his red hair and said, "Ha! Huh, this is the camp of Red Chief, the great Indian warrior." He's all right now," said Bill. He was examining some scratches on his legs. "We're playing Indians. I'm a hunter called Old Hank, and I'm Red Chief's prisoner. He's going to scalp me early tomorrow morning." The boy was having a lot of fun. He forgot he was our prisoner, because he loved camping out in the cave. He looked at me and said, "Your name is now Snake Eye. You're a spy. When the Indians return, they will cook you on the fire." We had dinner, and the kid ate a lot, and talked a lot. I like this place. I never camped out before. I hate school. Are there any real Indians in the forest? I want some more food. What makes your nose so red, Hank?、Uh, my father has lots of money. Are the stars hot? I don't like girls. Why are oranges round? Are there any beds in this cave? A parrot can talk, but a fish can't. The kid had a very loud voice, and he scared Bill. Red Chief, I said, "Do you want to go home?" Why? He asked. I don't have fun at home. I hate school. I like to camp out. Please don't take me home. All right, I said. We'll stay here in the cave for a while. Oh, good! He said. I never had so much fun in all my life. We went to bed at about eleven o'clock. Red Chief was between us. We couldn't sleep for three hours because he jumped up and down and screamed. He was still playing Red Chief. At last, I fell asleep, but I had bad dreams. I woke up because Bill was screaming like a frightened woman. It was terrible to hear a big, strong, fat man scream in that way. I jumped up, and what did I see? Red Chief was sitting on Bill. He was pulling Bill's hair with one hand, in the other hand he had a knife. He was trying to take Bill's scalp. I took the knife from the kid, but Bill was still terrified. He tried to sleep, but he couldn't. I slept a little, but then I remembered something. Red Chief wanted to cook me on the fire that morning. Sam. Do you think the kid's father will pay money for the little devil? Sure, I said. Parents love noisy little devils. Now you cook breakfast, and I'll come back in a few minutes. I walked to the top of the little mountain and looked down. The town of Summit was quiet. No one was looking for the kid or the kidnappers. I expected to see the men of the village running about with pitchforks. But everything was silent. I only saw one man working quietly in the country with his horse. The parents don't know about the kidnapping yet. I thought. When I returned to the cave, Bill was furious and his face was red. The boy wanted to throw a big rock at Bill. 
He put a hot potato down my back, said Bill, and I hit him. Be careful, said the kid to Bill. No one ever hit Red Chief before. After breakfast, the kid took a slingshot out of his pocket and went outside the cave. Do you think he'll run away, Sam? asked Bill. No, he won't. Today we have to send a message to his father. We must ask him for the ransom money. Just then we heard a loud cry. Red Chief was playing with the slingshot. Suddenly a rock hit Bill behind his left ear. He fell in the fire across a pot of hot water. I pulled him up and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. When Bill could finally speak, he said, "Don't go away and leave me alone with the kid, please." I went outside the cave and said angrily, "If you don't behave, I'll take you home. Now, are you going to be good?" I was only playing," he said sadly. "I didn't want to hurt old Hank, but why did he hit me? I'll behave, Snake Eye, but please don't send me home." Can I play Black Scout today? I don't know the game. I said, "You and Bill can decide." I'm going away for a while. Now come in and apologize to Bill. We went into the cave, and the kid apologized. Then I spoke to Bill. Today I'm going to Poplar Cove to send a letter to Mr. Dorset. I'm asking for the ransom money. You know, Sam. In the past, we did many dangerous things together. I was with you during earthquakes, fires, floods, cyclones, train robberies, and police raids, and I was never afraid of anyone or anything. But now, I'm afraid of this kid. So come back soon. I'll come back this afternoon. Now, let's write this letter. Part two. Bill and I started writing the letter. Red Chief played outside the cave. Let's ask Mr. Dorset for fifteen hundred dollars instead of two thousand. I don't think anyone will pay two thousand dollars for that terrible kid. Bill said, "This is the letter we prepared." Dear Mr. Dorset, we have your son. He is far from Summit. Don't try to find him. We want fifteen hundred dollars, and we will return your son to you. Send a messenger with your answer tonight at 8:30 p.m. Tell the messenger to come to Poplar Cove. At Poplar Cove, near the old bridge, there is a big tree with a small wooden box under it. The messenger must put your answer in that box. This is the same tree and the same box where you will put the ransom money at midnight. Do you want to see your son again? Then pay the money, and you will see him soon. Two desperate men. I put the letter in my pocket. The kid looked at me and said, "Snake Eye, I want to play Black Scout." You can play Black Scout now. Bill will play with you. What's the game like? I'm the Black Scout. I have to ride to the fort to help the pioneers," said the kid. "All right," I said. I think Bill will play with you. What must I do? Asked Bill. You're the horse," said the Black Scout. "Get down on your hands and knees. I must ride to the fort." Bill got down on his hands and knees. He was scared. Well, how far is it to the fort? He asked. Ninety miles," said the Black Scout. "And you must gallop fast because the pioneers are in danger." The Black Scout jumped on Bill's back and started kicking him. Please, Sam, come back soon," Bill said. "Listen, kid, don't kick me or I'll..." I went to Poplar Cove and talked to some people at the post office. One man said, "Old Mr. Ebenezer Dorset of Summit is upset because he can't find his son. The boy's probably lost or kidnapped." That was all I wanted to know. I mailed my letter and asked, "When is the mailman taking the mail to Summit?" In an hour," said a man at the post office. When I returned to the cave, there was no one. I looked around, but I couldn't find the kid or Bill. So I sat down and waited. After half an hour, I heard a noise behind me. 
I saw Bill. The kid was behind him. He was walking silently like a scout, and he had a big smile on his face. Bill stopped and took off his hat. He was very tired. Sam, said Bill, I'm not a coward, but that kid is impossible. I sent him home. He's gone. He rode on me for ninety miles. I had to eat sand for lunch. He asked me hundreds of questions and I had to answer them. Then he kicked my legs and... But now he's gone. I'm sorry to lose the ransom, Sam, but that kid was horrible. I was going crazy. Bill, I said, do you have heart disease? No. Why? Turn around and look behind you. Bill turned around and saw the kid. Poor Bill. He was very surprised. He suddenly sat down on the grass, and he couldn't speak. After some time, I said, This evening at 8.30 p.m., we'll have an answer from Dorset, and at midnight, we'll have the money. Then we can leave this place. Bill finally smiled weakly. I had a great plan for collecting the ransom money that evening. It was a professional plan. I found a tree at Poplar Cove near the road with big fields on all sides. I went to hide in the big tree, and I waited for the messenger. He arrived at 8.30 p.m. on a bicycle. He put a piece of paper in the box and returned to Summit. I waited an hour, climbed down the tree, got the letter, and returned to the cave. I read the letter to Bill. To two desperate men. Gentlemen, I received your letter today. I think the ransom you want is too big. I have an offer that you will probably accept. You bring Johnny home and pay me $250, and you will never see Johnny again. I promise. Please come tonight. Very respectfully, Ebenezer Dorset. What? I can't believe it, I cried. Bill looked at me and said, Sam, we've got $250. I don't want to spend another night with that kid. I'm going crazy. Let's accept Dorset's offer. You know, Bill, you're right. I'm really tired of the kid, too. We'll take him home, pay the ransom, and leave this place. We decided to take the kid home that night. Listen, kid, I said. Your father bought you a new rifle and a pair of Indian moccasins. Tonight we're going home to get the rifle and the moccasins. Tomorrow we're going to hunt bears in the forest. It was midnight when we arrived at Ebenezer's house. Bill gave him the two hundred fifty dollars. When the kid saw that we wanted to leave him at home, he was furious. He started screaming loudly and took Bill's leg. His father pulled him away with great difficulty. How long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not very strong, but I can probably hold him for ten minutes, said Mr. Dorset. Good, said Bill. In ten minutes, I'll run across most of the United States and reach Canada. Bill was fat, and he was not a good runner. But that night, no one ran faster than Bill.